Welcome to Kinship Cafe. I'm your host, Jim Jones. So glad you could join us today. And we are continuing our journey through the Tao Te Ching. And we are currently in chapter 62, I believe. So let's go ahead and, and we'll jump right in. And we're working primarily with the Adis Lombardo translation, which is one of our primary ones. Uh, we are going to look at a another alternate translation for the last section, but the first part of it will begin with the decent Lombardo. Tao is the mysterious center of all things. Now, this is um, really interpreted quite a bit. Uh, so from what I can tell, the, the core of this statement has to do with, I think it was the southwest corner of the house. Uh, and and this location, depending on the commentaries, had a lot of different ways that they talked about what this could refer to. It could be the place where they would normally have like the shrine that would be uh, maybe one of the more like sacred places of the house or a place of um, that was most special. Others would talk about it as where they would actually store the grain. And in that case, one of the things that was interesting is that was also where the females would sleep because there was kind of this mutual influence in terms of fertility between the woman to the grain helping with the agriculture in that sense or from the grain to the woman to help her be uh, more uh, fertile so it's kind of an interesting thing there but it became more of a female location of the house except for at night because then the man would also sleep there and so the thought was that it had an interesting transition between yin and yang within the house and that that might have been part of how it became that mysterious center of all things. Or like I said, the other part of it was maybe this is where they actually had like the family altar and that kind of thing set up. But in either case, they're trying to get at this idea that there is this mysterious center of all things that the Tao is representing or at least this corner of the house was meant to represent in terms of, you know, kind of a metaphorical way of looking at it. So Tao is the mysterious center of all things, a treasure for those who are good. Now I added the at here because it could be more likely translated in a Taoist sense, which tends to be less value laden in terms of trying to say things are good or bad. Um, good at in the sense of like accomplished or skilled. Um, and then it continues a refuge for those who are not. So this brings up a couple of uh, key things that we want to look at. One is the challenge of how do you talk about, and especially for translators, how they translate different concepts. And it is super frequent in the different translations I was looking at to want to talk about people who are good and people who are bad, uh, or even sometimes talking about this idea of good and evil. And so there's two things happening here. One is we got to wrestle with, are they trying to show the value language here? Or is this a problem of the ways that people are translating it? And the reason I say that is this could be being stated from a non-Daoist perspective. Like people will talk about good people and bad people, but the Tao includes them all would be one way we could look at this. Or it could be that from the Taoist perspective, they're not really talking about good and bad in the same sense, but they're talking more about people who are more adept maybe at living according to the Tao. But even those who are not adept at living according to the Tao, it's still the center or that, that storehouse for both of them. And in either way, we have this idea that nothing is excluded. The Tao is all encompassing. None of the people, however, they're going to be divided either along lines of skill or along the lines of value are excluded. And that is obviously center here, but it does bring up that interesting question about how do we talk about value and what do we mean by those who are good or good at and those who are not. So, 
maybe before I, I go on to the next section, I'll see if you guys have any thoughts on that. Not necessarily on trying to figure out whether it should be translated as good or not, but about the idea of it being all inclusive of all different kinds of people. I'm churning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty big departure I'm... from most religions, right? Most religions or even political things or any types of groupings tend to do a us versus them. And it's it's interesting yeah. that there's a real resistance to that kind of grouping. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Of course, so, accepting everyone is like, it's a compassionate thing to do and shows like impartiality and it's kind of giving everybody a chance sans judgment. Which I think like to your point, a lot of other religions are about, well, I, this isn't like a lot of religions, not other religions, are about judgment. Yeah, and it's hard to not have it, right? Because how do we make a distinction between anything if we're not having some kind of judgment? Obviously, we're not just sitting there doing nothing. And even if we were just sitting there doing nothing, we're making a judgment about that being better than doing something. So, you know, yeah. there, there's the necessity for us to have some type of uh, way of a, of delineating what we think we should be doing or what we think we shouldn't be doing. Um, and obviously there's a value we're putting on one or the other in the sense that we're actually moving forward with this plan versus this plan. Um, so I don't think that it is how do we get away from value judgments, period. Uh, because ultimately, you know, everything boils down to any type of motivation is some type of desire. And so there's some type of an appeal, some type of a judgment that's happening that's making one course of action versus another more desirable, whether that's trying to avoid pain or whether it's trying to be generous or whatever it is, there's something that's appealing to us. I think that the core aspect here, especially with the whole kind of anti-moral language that excuse me that we find in the Tao Te Ching is about recognizing that the value judgments are not uh objective that they are always subjective and it's not that we can ever be without desire or without judgments but that we need to constantly be reminded or that that these aren't permanent and that they sometimes change into each other. So previously we had this discussion about good people, bad people, um, and it was translated in various different ways. And one of the things that we saw is that where do good people come from, <laughs> right? They come from the bad people, right? And so you get this interesting relationship between the two that there's, you know, and, and in that passage, we were really looking more at this idea of skilled uh, as opposed to like the judgment of good versus bad, but an unskilled person, you know, is the source of the skilled person, right? And so you can't really discount one from the other. They belong together and they kind of sometimes will transform into each other. Same thing when they were talking about nobility, that the root of nobility is the humble, right? That there's this transition, but also they have this idea of, of, like position, you know, that the noble person isn't really different from the other people. He's just holding a particular office that allows for certain things to happen. And there's certain responsibilities that come with that. And we might be able to say similar things about skilled, you know, what are the responsibilities that come with that? And what type of role does that person then take on? And so that doesn't get rid of this idea of desire or judgment, but it does move it into the realm of recognizing that it's very subjective and sometimes can be used in ways that are not uh, expected. Uh, and then there's another piece of this that I find kind of interesting. Before I became much more uh, specific in my diet, <laughs> 
uh, I used to pride myself on liking all different kinds of things. I still do. It's not that I don't like them. I just, you know, abstain from certain things because I'm trying to, you know, um, be as healthy as possible. Uh, but the thing that I would laugh about with like my brother, who's a very picky eater, there's all kinds of stuff he just doesn't like. And I thought, man, you're missing out on so much of life because you're so particular. If you would be more open in your approach, there's much more of life that you could enjoy. And there's an aspect of that here too, that when we get very particular about things, um, there's much more of life that we have to rule out, uh, much more of life that we can't enjoy or doesn't have the ability to bring us the gifts that it has to offer. And if we only are you know, dividing people along certain lines, we might miss out on a lot of the population that maybe has a lot to bring to us or a lot of ways that it could enrich our lives. So there's another aspect of this that I think is recognizing the totality. Uh, same thing when we talk about life and death in the Tao. Um, you know, death is just as much a part of what life is as the life part, and you can't have one without the other. And so if you try to hold on to life by rejecting death, you end up kind of distorting or corrupting what that life is. You have to embrace the totality. And here we have that that same idea again. Same idea again. Sorry, I don't know what's in my throat right now. It's I like the line that you're drawing from being a picky eater to being like closed minded about certain people. It's like <laughs> such an easy way to talk to people about this and how mm -hmm. like if they're not very accepting people it's like okay well you're kind of a picky eater when it comes to opening up to people like how mm -hmm. do you feel about that <laughs> <laughs> yeah that is interesting okay so let's see where it goes from here then beautiful words can be traded um, so there's an idea of, of like the marketplace here that's coming into the text and the idea of people who are eloquent speakers and what they can do with that. So there's a value that's being picked up on beautiful words, or we could talk about this in the sense of being skilled at or good at um, that is valued in the marketplace. And the same thing with actions, noble deeds can enhance reputations. So if we're thinking about the good at person, we could see here some good at in terms of speaking, good at in terms of deeds. And these can be things that, at least at a social level, can have value in terms of you know, advancement or how a person is viewed in terms of their reputation. Um, you know, if we took it into modern day language, you know, having certain skills uh, can help you to be promoted in your position. And if you happen to be a good public speaker, that can be beneficial in certain cases. So there's this valuing that we can see that happens. It says, but if people lack them in terms of these skills, why should they be rejected? So we're kind of back to the same idea at the beginning about the totality. Maybe somebody's not a, the most eloquent speaker. Does that mean they don't have anything of value to say or that we can simply dismiss them or somebody's actions? Do we get to just dismiss somebody because maybe they've made some mistakes in the past or, um, you know, the circumstances caused them to have to do things that were considered you know, maybe illegal or less than desirable. I mean, how much of our society, there's interesting questions that happen all the time in terms of, you know, should somebody who's been convicted of a felon be able to vote? Um, you know, that's that kind of really gets directly to this question of if they lack those noble deeds, does that mean that they don't have a voice anymore? They're interesting questions. Maybe I'll pause here before we go on to the next section, see if you have any thoughts about this. It's, I wonder where this thought even started, because I think, like, I mean, they're talking about it here, and how long ago was this, you know, like, the thought of 
closing people out just because of who they are or how they think or their skills, you know? It just seems kind of crazy to me because I'll, if somebody who doesn't speak eloquently is trying to speak, chances are they have something good to say, mm. you know? I like this chapter a lot. Yeah, there's a lot that gets you thinking here. Um, yeah. And, it, it, you know, it's something I try to check myself on because I do this all the time <laughs> in the sense of, um, you know, I've got a fair amount of background in, albeit from a lay perspective, in scientific thought. And there's a lot of people that I very quickly dismiss if they start talking about things that fall outside of those parameters, you know, and, and is that something that I should be doing or does that make sense? And so there is an interesting balance here. So, uh, you know, if somebody's going to be talking about the fact that they don't think that gravity exists, uh, well, maybe not, that's not the right way to put it, but let's say that they think that it, it doesn't need to be taken into an account if you're trying to figure out how to, uh, you know, launch something. It's going to be easy for me to dismiss that idea because even though everything from a scientific perspective still needs to be held provisionally because there could always be new data that's going to update what we believe about things, there's some things that have really stood the test of time in terms of, you know, this has been extremely accurate way of understanding these particular patterns in the world. And my, my confidence level in it, even though it might not be a hundred percent is pretty darn high. And you're going to have to have some pretty compelling evidence for me to think of it otherwise. But uh, that compelling evidence may show up in unexpected places. Uh, and so we can't be too quick to dismiss, um, but we also need to, in some sense, move forward with the things that we have established. Like if we had to reprove gravity every single time we thought about any type of ongoing experiment or thing that we want to do, we would never get anywhere. So there is a certain amount of like, okay, we're, we're collecting information and we're learning things and we can build upon what we've learned. And to the degree that we have confidence in that it becomes easier to dismiss contrary ideas but there's still a check that has to be in there somehow and i'm not sure exactly where that line is but i think at least at one level it can be one in terms of value we can at least say that it's not a bad thing that somebody is questioning the data or a bad thing that somebody has a different idea we might not agree but that doesn't get into then the value judgment. And, and I think that's probably a key aspect of it. Um, but it is an interesting, you know, how do we balance these things and, and think about them? Uh, Dane brought up last week that interesting uh, debate that happened in, in the social media world and the science world with the, was the guy's Terrence Howard, I think is his Terrence name. Howard. Yeah. yeah. I'll be right and, back, by the way. I'm still listening. Okay. And so he came up with that idea that he was challenging the idea that one times one equaled one and was trying to claim, well, actually it equals two. And so that started quite a debate along with several other things that he brought up. And, um, you know, it was interesting the different ways that people addressed it. And some people tried to approach it from a position of trying to understand what he had to say, and then also trying to share with him why they understood it differently in more productive ways than other people who just simply dismissed it. Um, and again, it gets into, I guess, what the goal is. Is the goal to try and figure out how to correct him, or is the goal to be able to hear what other people have to say? You know, there's a lot of different variables that come into play, but at it, it, it a very minimum, I think that this really is a check on our normal uh, tendency to dismiss people that are outside of our camp, whatever that camp may be. And there's certainly a lot of areas where there's a lot less um, objective evidence to judge whether something is the correct answer or the wrong answer. And so I, th I think this is a good way to, to 
to keep those things in mind. You guys, yeah, have... it's kind of crazy how many people like question a lot of these things. Like all these conspiracy theorists have all these thoughts on, like, why the things we've been told are wrong by the experts, like Neil deGrasse Tyson and like Stephen Hawking and all these people. It's like, how do you think that you know better than them? Like, you have to have some level of trust in people that have these skills that you don't have and vice versa. I don't know. It's just crazy to me. Yeah. But at the same time, it is not untrue that there have been some big revolutions in thought because the trusted authorities have in the past turned out to be wrong <laughs> or have abused that trust. Right. So it... Right. Innocent until proven guilty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's... It's definitely one of those ideas that when you first are hearing this, you're like, oh, this kind of makes a lot of sense, like the, the picky eater uh, idea. But it does get a little bit more complicated when you try to put it into actual practice. And um, yeah, it, it I think it's a, a very good thing, though, to be keeping in mind so that we don't too quickly dismiss things that maybe we need to give a little bit more of a, a hearing for. All right, so where do we go from here then? When the Son of Heaven is enthroned. Now, this is a term that um, I think we've talked in the past about the Warring States period that this is really emerging out of is happening in the course of history where there's been a significant change in terms of the empire, in particular, moving from the Zhang... Uh, Shang Empire or Dynasty to the Zhong, excuse me, Zhou. I don't know why I'm getting so tongue-tied this morning. Uh, but one of the developments that happened in this particular transition was the more, um, we could almost think of it in terms of the propaganda. How did they justify the Zhou Empire taking over the Shang Empire? And one of the ways they started to talk about it was this idea of the mandate of heaven, that there is, uh, and, and this was really interpreted in lots of different ways, and it kind of evolves over time. But certainly by the time we get to the Warring States period, when the Taoists are having their discussions, there was a lot of thought of heaven, this idea of Tian, as a way of talking about the natural aspects of things, or maybe another way of even talking about nature as opposed to like a deity or some type of uh, power. And so when they talked about the mandate of heaven, it was almost as though there's a certain way of nature that if a ruler isn't actually fulfilling the proper role of rulership and in, in the sense of benefiting the people, that there's going to be a change, that that mandate is going to be taken away. And whether that was seen from some groups as some type of deity actually removing power in shaping events or in more of the naturalized sense that there was a natural transition that was going to happen because the abuse of power um in either case then the person who's now installed in this sense of the mandate of heaven is identified or thought of in terms of the son of heaven so this is a tricky one in the Western world because uh, the heavy Christian influence, of course, the Son of Heaven has very uh, strong theological terms that we have to be careful when we're translating to recognize they are not in any way using this in the same way that it would happen, let's say, within a Christian context. But the primary idea of this title here is about the ruler who's going to be enthroned. Um, and certainly there were still elements within China that had more of the supernatural perspective and that and that Tian was actually something more akin to like a deity. But there was also large movements that saw it as exactly the opposite. So we don't want to get too hung up on that, but I did want to touch on it because it is kind of a, a, uh, a term that 
would seem oddly familiar in our Western context. Okay, so in essence, this is saying when the ruler is enthroned. Yes. Okay. Yes. And the three ministries installed. So this would be the top three ministers uh, that go along with the ruler uh, when they get installed. So there's this idea of the transition of power. And this could be either at the entire, you know, empire level, or it could even be at some sub level, right? Where one of the things that happens with the Zhou dynasty is you end up setting up essentially different, um, um, like, almost like feudal lords. And so there's an aspect even at these different, like, let's say, nation states within the overall nation that have their own. So in our case, you know, we can think about, well, yes, there's the federal government, but there's also the state government. And so at the state level, you still have the person who's in charge and the key people underneath them. So this could happen at a couple of different levels. So during this process or when these key dignitaries are being installed, there's different things that would normally happen. So presenting jade discs and four horse chariots. So this would be something that would be more of the standard practice of what would happen at this time frame to show um, recognizing the honor of these positions and the individuals who are holding these positions would be to present these things. It says, cannot compare to sitting still and offering the Tao. So we're, we've got a big transition that's happening. We went from talking about how Tao is inclusive of what could be termed good people as well as bad people, that is much more inclusive, and looking at the fact that just because somebody has eloquent speech or just because they have uh, noble actions, that this doesn't necessarily mean that they are in fact good. These things could be used for ill. We see all kinds of political leaders who are smooth talkers and on a surface level, their actions look positive, but yet how they respond to things is maybe, maybe it's a subterfuge, right? That this, these things that are considered good are just something they're actually hiding behind in terms of their ulterior motives. So here, what's where this then comes into play when we start to think about, again, this governing aspect is, okay, here are the people who are in charge and normally they would be honored with these gifts of jade and these four horse drawn chariots. And the suggestion is that it would be better if in fact they went into this idea, it's a sitting still, this kneeling, this um, maybe even this meditative type of an approach and focusing on the Tao and understanding how that works. So there's this idea that in the past, the great leaders that they had are the ones that are maybe held up in terms of, you know, their, their histories of the Chinese people, that there were great leaders and that they were great because they actually understood or, or, or really focused more on the idea of how does the Tao function? How do we work in conjunction with that, as opposed to simply receiving these gifts that were, um, um, you know, that were presented to them that were trying to show their honor or status or rank uh, in terms of the jade and the and the horses, horse-drawn chariots. Any thoughts on this before we move to its conclusion? Is it saying that the Son of Heaven should be doing the sittings? No, because I guess the Son of Heaven would be receiving the jade discs and four horse chariots. So why was that so hard to say? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everybody's tongue tied. What's going on? Yeah. I guess we're failing the the uh, eloquent speech this morning. That's right. <laughs> we're still worth listening to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's the implication is that it's the is of more value to those who are being installed to focus on what is the Tao and how does it supply to their role of being the empire, the emperor or, you know, the top ministers. 
is the contrast that's being made. Okay. And the three ministries, I've heard that before as like, um, like different virtues, like compassion or humility or frugality. Could that also be well, what they're saying? So um, in different governing terms, uh, we can break things out in terms of things like governors or, um, you know, secretaries or so forth, uh, presidents, right? But in other contexts, you would talk about a minister, like the minister of defense or the minister of, of education, right? And so the ministries here is really talking about these three top offices and and it, um, I'd have to look exactly which these three are, but they're specific categories, like the Ministry yeah. of Defense or the Ministry of Education. Um, so it's, it. it's using it at that level. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So again, the the value statement is coming into consideration here. What are we valuing? Are we valuing the display of the jade or the four horse-drawn chariots that are providing the impression of somebody having value or being um, worthy of their position? Or is the thing that should be valued the ability to be in tune with and work in harmony with the Tao? This is what's being challenged here, what's really important in this context. And I think the implication, <clears throat> given the time frame, is maybe that in the past, it was considered more valuable to be in a tune with Tao, whereas now, maybe they're saying that it's become more important to have these outward shows of what's considered good in terms of the display of wealth and power right that's the the contrast that's being brought up here so then it's going to conclude the ancients honored this Tao. so going back to who were the rulers before and what did they do and i'll just say here the, in this last couple of sentences we're going to see another example of where we get into some translation troubles. And it, it's remarkable when we look at the different ways that this is translated, how it's looked at. And you can really see the influence of Western thinking, I believe, in terms of how we <clears throat> look at some of these. So it's going to say, you know, the, answer, the ancients honored this Tao. Didn't they say, through it, seekers find? Through it, the guilty escape. So this is interesting. Um, a lot of things here uh, start to trigger other lines of thought in terms of, let's say, our Western Christian tradition. So certainly one of the key lines um, in Christian thinking is this idea that if you seek, you'll find, or if you knock, the door will be opened. Um, and there's an implication here that there is a benefit in terms of how the deity and the Christian context, this idea of God, is going to assist the seeker. That if you're really wanting to find something, and if you're really wanting to know something, that if you put forth the effort of seeking or knocking on the door, that ultimately these things are going to be open to you. And there's an implication that there's a response, you know, from from the deity in that process. And, and the second line then through it, the guilty escape, this has been translated even in our other uh, book that we normally look at, the, the Fung and English translation, it'll say, and the center, the sinners find forgiveness, right? Which is really uh, kind of so inconsistent with the rest of the Tao Te Ching. It's, it's fascinating how the translators go there, but they weren't alone. There was a lot of different translations that kind of go down this road. But here, I think we're seeing, you know, this influence of what's happening from the um, cultural, the modern day cultural influence in terms of how they're translating some of these aspects. So we'll we'll start here with this Edison Lombardo translation. 
Why was Tao honored? They're saying, you know, because through it, if you're seeking for something, you're going to find it. Now, if we work with this way that it's translated, there's almost like a cause and effect type of an idea here that if you're seriously reflecting on the Tao and trying to understand how it works, that it's going to maybe not from a supernatural perspective, but maybe just as a cause and effect effect, uh, you know, issue, help you to get to what you're looking for, because you're actually paying attention to the way things work, the balance of things, the harmony of things. And if you are focusing on those, then you're going to actually find what you're looking for. And then the second line through it, the guilty escape, this, you know, if we think about how the opening line gets translated in talking about the good person versus the bad person and that the Tao is a treasure for both of them. Here we could see how they're trying to bring out this idea that even the person who is maybe guilty of something somehow is going to find escape from that consequence. Um, this one, I think, gets a little bit more challenging in terms of like the sinners finding forgiveness or so forth. Um, another way that escape can legitimately be translated is avoid. So you can also have this concept of avoiding things that would cause you to be guilty or, you know, some type of action that you're trying to not do, right? It'll keep you out of trouble. In, a, in other words, if you're paying attention to the Tao and working according to uh, moving in harmony with that. And then the way this translation concludes, then it says, this is why Tao is honored under heaven. So it brings it back into the first sentence here on the screen that why was Tao honored? Well, because of this, uh, because it helped them find what they were looking for and it helped them avoid or escape things that were maybe um, not good. And so it's saying that this is why Tao was honored. But Tao in this line at the bottom doesn't exist in the sentence. It's being supplied by the translator. It's not in square brackets in the translation. I put it there so that we could just kind of keep that in our mind. Um, so it's making an assumption that this last line is talking about why Tao is honored under heaven. But there's a whole other way that this can be taken. And, and maybe just before we look at that other, um, well, let's just go ahead and look at the other alternate translation of these last couple of lines. Why, why did the ancients honor this Tao? So that part's essentially the same. One does not say that they did it for the purpose of gain. So this is really different, right? Uh, you still have this idea where they're talking about finding something that you're searching for. But in the previous line, it said, did they not say that if you seek, you're going to find it? Well, here... It's understood about not saying differently. The other one said is because in the original, it's, it's very minimalistic and it literally says not say. So what do they mean by not say? The previous translation took it as didn't they say seek and you'll find. Here it's saying they didn't say that if you just look for it, you're going to find it or you're going to gain right? So it's it's kind of turning a little bit on its head. But if we think about what happened previously with this idea of the person being installed, who's having this seat of honor, that they weren't seeking it for the purpose of gain. Again, this would be for those that were actually sitting and reflecting on Tao. If they were moving into that position of rulership, they weren't doing it for the purpose of gain. And by because they were focused on the Tao, they saw more of what their office was, what their role was, and that it's ultimately for the benefit of the larger community, for the empire. And we've seen this political discussion frequently in the Tao Te Ching, that if you end up with someone in a position of power that's there for their own personal gain, or that's there uh, because they want to enact their own uh, agenda, or that they're showing bias, that this is going to be very destructive. And so rather, if someone is actually focused on Tao, and they find themselves being installed in this position, they are not doing it for the purpose of gain. 
really turns this whole thing around in terms of how it's being translated. And then the final line says, rather, they wish to be free from offenses. So this really pulls out that idea of avoiding the offense as opposed to finding forgiveness for sin. So it's a very different um, angle here, which makes a lot more sense when, when we have more of a naturalistic understanding of what Tao is. It's not that Tao can somehow grant this idea of forgiveness or escape from consequences, but rather it's a way to help avoid uh, offending. And this, I think, makes a lot more sense in terms of how the rest of the passage has unfolded, as well as the, the Tao Te Ching as a whole. And then the final line is, therefore, they, in this case, the rulers who are focusing on the Tao, rather than just accepting the jade and the, and the horse-drawn carriages or, or chariots, that they were honored under heaven. So remember, Tao wasn't in this last line. There's an, you have to make an interpretive call about who is un, honored under heaven. The previous one wanted to say that this is why Tao is honored, but here they're saying if the rulers are actually following Tao, that those rulers would then be the ones that are honored under heaven because of the fact that they're not there for their personal gain and because of their adherence to the Tao, they're avoiding offense and they are then being there essentially for the benefit of the people as opposed to for their own personal goals. Does that make sense? Yeah, this one makes a lot more sense than the other one, in my opinion. The guilty line, especially with the question mark, really threw me for a loop there. Like, yeah, is it inner guilt? Or are they guilty of a crime? I, I don't know. It just seems so out of left field. I say I think... as a lefty. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I think, you know, it's definitely, you can see the cultural influences of modern day translators, how, how it can end up maybe not even consciously bringing in concepts that are kind of maybe a little bit more foreign to its uh, original context. Uh, but I think here we see much more clearly how these things fit together. Yeah. And I noticed there was a couple of comments earlier, but I'm not able to read those while it's going through that. Is that anything that were they questions about? Okay. Nope. Dwayne um, stepped away um, and oh. then came back. Gotcha. So this actually um, concludes the chapter. So we've got a little bit of time left if there is any uh, thoughts about this or any other questions. I, I like this chapter a lot. I think it really highlights like what compassion and forgiveness can do for leaders um, and what not to do as, you know, like it's not all jade and chariots. Sometimes you just got to focus on what you can do and on the inside, I guess, and um, trust that that is going to be the the right choice. Yeah, and trust uh, other people, regardless of their backgrounds. There's definitely an emphasis on the value of the common person in the Tao Te Ching, uh, frequently, right? That they have the ability to do what's right if you just give them the opportunity. Um, yeah. And, I, you know, to at the risk of bringing in the value laden uh, language, there's this idea of doing what's right, not just trying to find ways to benefit personally. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot to be said here, I think. Definitely gets you thinking. Yeah. I know I there are a couple times I like you, you would say something and then I wouldn't hear you for the next few minutes because my brain would just be like cranking on that <laughs> one line you know uh, yeah yeah gotta well, process it 
this will give you something to chew then chew on then over the yes week. and uh yeah we'll go ahead and we'll connect again next week but if um if you've been watching this video and you'd like to be a part of this discussion, you can register your email at kinship.cafe. That's www.kinship.cafe. And you'll get a link for our live Friday morning Zoom discussions. And if you happen to be in the Southern California area, we also meet in person on Sundays. If you'd like to join that, you'll also have an invitation, as well as links to the latest videos when they come out. So um, thanks again, everybody, for being here. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Thanks, Jim. Thanks.